This is Things Police See, first-hand accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm your host, Steve Gould. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, episode number 111, believe it or not. Behind this episode is uh, a bunch, a ton of hours of interviews of the men and women of law enforcement telling you what it's really like, unedited, unfiltered, to be a police officer. The kind of calls they respond to, I encourage them not to hold back um, at all and just to put it out there so you can gain a better appreciation for what these men and women do. That's the point of the podcast. Um, We have people supporting us through Patreon, which I'm so appreciative of. I want to get that going, right? Meow. With uh, with a little roll call action. Oh, yeah. Love you guys. I'm in love with you. The great Sarah Pomroy. Andy Biggs, Adam Mihal, Alex Wasik, Brandon Hooker, Chris June, Dylan Pyrozik, Gary Steiner, the great Gary Steiner, Jake Pinedo, John Shoemaker, Lauren Stimson, Lane Campbell, the great Seth Wright, Deputy William James Long, and Tony Fahey. Got some more. I got a few more. Got two lists now, guys. You gotta give me a second. This thing's gonna shut off. I know it. David Viveros, Ricardo Zuniga, the great Thomas Connell, Luke Irvig, Corey Payne, Jacob Ruth, Rich Emery, Scott O'Donnell, and David Diaz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a mouthful, but it's worth it. You guys are who support the show monthly, consistently. You keep uh, you keep the lights on. You motivate me to to keep doing the show. And um, I truly, truly appreciate it. I want to thank everybody for the five-star reviews recently. Um, Apple Apple uh, Podcasts, that helps the show, helps get eyes on the show for when I'm looking for guests or, um, you know, trying to get people to to, to find it. That really helps because it comes up in, in searches more prominently, the better and more reviews it has. So if you have a minute, I would appreciate that. Today's episode is going to be, it's going to be a good one. Um, this gentleman has 17 years. He has 17 years on the Somerville Mass Police Department as a detective. He was assigned to the ATF as a task force agent. In the course of duty, he was shot multiple times, which ultimately led to his retirement. He's the president and co-founder of the Violently Injured Police Officers Organization, and he has a book out called Gun Runner. Um, you can check out um, the the VIPO911.org is the Violently Injured Police Officer Organization's website, VIPO911.org. The guys, um, I know Somerville personally. I'm a mass guy. Um, Mario Oliveira, who I'm about to bring on, is the son of Massachusetts, and it's a busy, busy town, especially with what he was doing. So without further ado, let me bring on Mario. Mario, welcome to the show, sir. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Steve. Oh, my pleasure, man. You... You look very familiar to me, and I know, I know we have people in common because I went to police academy with um, Soares. They called him Soares in academy, but it's probably Soares, right? Yeah, Eddie Soares. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, uh, geez, I, I I had the name last time, and I, I I'm trying to think of that class. So you probably had fiftieth uh, MPC. Jose, Jose Ramirez. No, it was Soares, and it was. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed now. I should have written this down. I was just talking about it with my wife. But it was two guys. Um, but I know Somerville is stacked and packed. It's like uh, it's only a couple square miles, and there's like hundreds of thousands of people that live there. Yeah, very true. <laughs> it's a very busy place. And you got you got teamed up with the ATF on like a, a federal task force. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it was pretty uh, pretty exciting and um, a great opportunity for me in my career. Yeah, it's cool. Those task forces are cool because it's um, people think a lot of times you become a, a local or a city cop, and that's you know that's it. But it's not true. There, I know I know a lot of guys on town police departments that are on task forces, and they do they do bus all over New England. It takes them. You get involved with the federal guys, and they're more than happy to have your help. Absolutely. Awesome. So, was is Somerville the only police department you work for? Uh, yes, that was the only agency that I worked for. Um, and then obviously the ATF. 
And then I retired in 2014. Is there any, when you get on the ATF task force, is there, it's like an application process. Is there any additional training you had to go to or was it? Um, no, with them, they have to, you have to qualify quarterly. So you have to be a, pretty much an expert marksman with okay. a firearm. Um, they do a lot of firearms training, as one can imagine. And um, I, I like that because I like guns. Yeah, so me too. So for me, I was fine with it. Yeah. Heck yeah. So you have a a really great story to tell. Um, it's people, are, people will be blown away. It's, it's a really cool story. I want to build up to it. I want to ask you a few warm up questions. Let's call them um, as we sure. get there. And uh, we can talk about what the big story and what your mission ultimately is now. But can you take us way back to um, a young officer, Oliveira, um, to the first hot call you went to the first call that really got your heart pumping? Yeah, it was actually my first night out of FTO. Um, I had a, a, a motor vehicle pursuit through four different cities with a stolen car. Wow. And I uh, ended up in a crash and a arrest and just a, a, an adrenaline dump afterwards. That was my first time experiencing a major adrenaline dump. I bet. And when you're, when you're in the city doing a, doing a chase like that, do you guys have like a code one, like a radio silence? It's the frequency is yours for the chase. Yeah. Luckily I was actually, I had a partner and, um, so it was a two man car and he was driving. I was on the radio and again, lucky for me before I was, I became a cop. I was a dispatcher in my department. So okay. that, that actually helped me a lot being calm, cool, collected on the radio. Yeah. That's something we all struggle with when we're, especially when we're new trying to get the transmissions out without, um, you know, the quiver in your voice, you know, from the excitement. Yeah. So were you guys both, both rookies? No, no. Steve was a, um, a senior guy. I happened to be partnered with him that evening. And, um, first call out of the gate, we pulled into a gas station to get gas. And my, we happened to look over at this car, had about five kids in it. They looked like a bunch of dirt bags. It just didn't look right. They looked away as we looked at them. And when I called on the plate, her on the radio, stolen vehicle. The minute they said that, kids took off out of the uh, gas station and it, the chase was on. Right. And so this was a while ago. So this was, I mean, departments used to be a little more chase friendly, let's say. I mean, the updated, yeah. the updated policies now are like, it's almost within the now, guidelines of the chase policies. You can't do anything without liability. Right. Like no, motor, can't do anything. motorcycles completely out. Like basically a motorcycle can do almost anything and you can't chase them. <laughs> and then, um, a straight up chase, a lot of, a lot of departments policies are like, you know, they talk about like not going exceeding the speed limit. It's like, it's a chase policy. What do you mean? It's like, it's like they're, they're so, so, um, uh, worried about liability. They, they, they won't allow cops to do it all. And I get it. Some, you don't want to chase somebody for like unlicensed and have them crash into some mom and her kid and kill them, you know, but at the same time, if people, if people kind of hear that they can run, it's just going to make that behavior. It's going to, you know, make it happen more often, you know? Mm -hmm. And criminals are aware of that. They know that. Right. I mean, yeah, look at Springfield with the dirt bike problem. Um, there, there's dirt bikes pulling up to cop cars and kicking in the side of cop cars at red lights and then taking off because they know cops can't do anything or they'll, you know, they'll ride over right the hood of a cop car. Ridiculous. It seems insane to me. It's like, it reminds me of the videos in police Academy. They would show us like Oakland and the, the mayhem over there. And it would be like, cops would retreat. They would pull up to a street corner. People start firing the guns in the air, start shooting at the police car and it was like, not only would they retreat, they wouldn't come back. They'd be like, oh, this, wow. this part of the neighborhood's yours, I guess. I mean, I don't know. It's it's awful. I hate lawlessness like that. But um, so you chased the guy, got all of them, the whole, the, all the occupants? No, I got the driver. The, uh, the other two occupants or three occupants fled. We got the driver, placed him under arrest, transported back to headquarters, and he was charged. And oddly enough, a few a few years later, my brother, who was also a cop on this in the same department, had him for the same thing. Really? Car yeah, car chase, and he caught him too. <laughs> That's shameful for him. 
<laughs> taken down yeah. by the by the Oliveira family twice. Yeah, two brothers. That's awesome. Um, Mario, can you describe uh, like a very strange or bizarre moment from the job? Um, Jesus, so many. I guarantee you, too. You're gonna we'll we'll be done with this in two days from now. You'll be like, oh my gosh, this was the one. I mean, I I, I think one of the most strangest bizarre moments was a uh, a woman that actually she was non comp. You know, a little some mental health issues going on. Yep. And uh, I went to a house for a. To, to help her, she actually grabbed me and pulled me on her bed with her. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I don't know what her problem was, but I was so embarrassed, like I didn't know what to do. <laughs> this woman just completely grabbed me, beer hugged, fell back into the bed with me, and was you know doing whatever the hell she was doing. I jumped up, I was like skeeved out. What the hell is going on? <laughs> yeah, she wasn't assaulting me; she was more like groping me. Yeah, yeah. Well, man yeah. in a man in uniform, you know. Yeah. She- <laughs> I've had, um, I've had, uh, to help, you know, elderly people, you know, you get, you get there before the fire department, there's like a fall or something like that, but I've had some, um, or, or just elderly woman alone. Um, I've seen that before, like more, than, not so aggressive, but more than happy to have the attention of the police and the firefighters, you know, kind of like very, yeah. very flirty, but 80. So you're like, this is kind of odd. It's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, did, were you alone for that or no, I had a partner with me. Thank goodness. Because that's, yeah. that's the next thing, you know. Oh, he, he threw me on the bed. Right. No, she, she was well known for, to our department, so I don't, think any, I don't think she would ever be taken seriously anyway. Oh, good, good. Um, yeah, that's funny. So, Mario, can, let's get into um, the big event in your career, the, um, the shooting you were involved in. Can you tell us the details surrounding that events and, and the outcome and um, where it took you? Yeah, so basically um, in 2000, and signed to the ATF. And um, in 1968, the government passed the gun control law of 1968. That's what it's called. And basically it requires, this federal law requires FFL dealers. So anybody who purchases more than two firearms in a span of five business days, those shops have to report those transactions to the local ATF office. And I got one of these such reports in uh, early October. It was a young man, 21 years old from my city, who purchased 10 guns in a week. Now I I ask you, how many 21 year olds do you know that buy 10 guns in a week? Yeah, not many. Not many. So to any officer, anybody in law enforcement, you would think it's a little suspect, right? Yeah. That would make you like go, hmm, what's going on here? You must be thinking like this is either like a gun nut. He went crazy. He turned 21 and was like, I've been waiting to do this. Right. Either he's a, a gun fanatic or because of my experience at the ATF, which was limited at that time, he's a straw purchaser. And, and we're trained to look for those types of activity and whatnot. So immediately I, upon looking at his name, I knew that there was something strange about this because I knew the kid's name. It rang a bell to me. Hmm. And what I did was I remember sliding over to the left side of my cubicle where I kept my Salvo police laptop and I queried his name. And lo and behold, it was a kid that I had charged criminally for an armed robbery a couple of years prior. Wow. So, so I said to myself, how in the world is this kid who has a gun charge on his BOP able to buy guns in New Hampshire? This isn't right. So that prompted me to dig a little bit more. And through my investigation, I learned that the kid met another, he befriended another another young man on Facebook. And he met him up in New Hampshire. And he paid this kid 500 bucks to put his name on the kid's lease in New Hampshire to show that he has residency in New Hampshire. In in New Hampshire, aren't they, don't they do the federal FBI check? They do. They do a very limited check. It's not as thorough as it is in Massachusetts. Okay. Um, so this kid went up and, and met at the end of September. Met this kid from Pelham, New Hampshire. Paid him money, five hundred bucks. The kid took his cash and then renewed his lease, his annual lease at his apartment, and wrote down that Matt was his roommate. Now he's got residency. Perfect for him. Exactly. So, with a copy of this fictitious lease 
Matt went up to the RMV on October 8th and got a New Hampshire driver's license, all the while having a mass driver's license. Both, So he's holding dual active licenses, one in Mass, one in New Hampshire. And for all your for police officer listeners, we all know that's illegal. You can't do that. Right. So finding this out, now I'm really curious, like what the hell is going on here? This is not right. Um, and right around this time, I got a new partner. His name was Brian Higgins. Brian had just graduated the academy, was assigned up to the Boston office. And um, he got assigned to this case with me. So I brief him, tell him what's going on. And uh, I use a common tool that cops use, a ruse. And I, I sought the opportunity to show Brian how to, how to effectively pull off a ruse. I called the suspect up. I learned through doing some digging that he was stabbed in the shoulder at a house party several months before. So I called him up and said, hey, uh, we made an arrest tonight at the, at the station, and the kid that we have in, in, the, in the cell just gave us information on the guy that stabbed you. And we're looking to see if you'd be willing to come in and look at a photo array. Can you come in tomorrow? Nice. And the kid said, yeah, sure, I'll come in. I looked at Brian. I'm like, here we go. Perfect. We're on. So the suspect came in the following day thinking he was going to look at a photo array, but what he was really coming for was we wanted to question him about these purchases. Right. So he comes in. I'll kind of like speed up a little bit. So he comes in. Ultimately, after a, a short interview, he confesses to everything. Wow. Fully confesses. Yeah. Said that um, he told us about meeting the kid up in Pelham, getting the fictitious lease, yada, yada. And he said, basically, these gang members from Boston call me. They put in their order. They tell me what they want. He would go up to New Hampshire with his own cash, pay 450 bucks cash. He would use a Dremel and he would obliterate the serial numbers to these guns mm. and then drive them to Boston, meet these gang member, members there and sell them on the street for 1800 Ooh, making some dough. So, yeah, so this kid made fourteen grand his first week in operation. Wow. So he was seeing dollar signs, big time. All right. So he bought them for four hundred of his own cash, flipped it for eighteen hundred. So on average, he was making thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars per gun profit. Damn. And then these guns were then used in the commission of a variety of crimes: murders, shootings, robberies, you name it. Because Boston PD and the other guys from my teams from ATF were recovering these firearms at various crime scenes several days later. Awful. Yeah. So we obtain a full confession. We recover two more firearms because he admits that he has them in his trunk, unsecured. So he admitted driving across state lines from New Hampshire into Mass without having a license to carry having these firearms unsecure in his car. So he admits to all of this. So ultimately, he, this kid's looking at some serious federal charges, right? When you add it all up. Right. A whole a multitude of federal viola- gun violations. And, I mean, I'm not great in math, but my guesstimation, he was looking at 30 years plus Oof. in federal prison based on all the charges that I easily had him for, and he confessed to So rather than being a jerk cop, I wanted to be a fair person. Like I've always been my whole life. I looked at him as if he could be like my little brother. He's 21 years old. Yeah. Dumb kid. kid. Got caught up, got caught up with the wrong crew. I wanted him to write his, to, to put him in the right path, you know, the path to righteousness. So I said to him, well, first I called the um, AUSA, US, U.S. Attorney's Office, and I got their permission to flip this kid as an informant and they gave me their blessing. So I went back into the room with, uh, with the suspect and my partner. And I said, Hey, here's an opportunity of a lifetime. You can either go to federal prison or you can work for team America. I like that. Get on board and, and cooperate and work with the, with the police. Help us take out these, these criminals in Boston that are actually shooting and murdering people. Those are the people that need to be in jail. Right. You know, prioritize the vicious criminals versus the dumb criminals like this kid who 
should know better, but doesn't know doesn't know better. You know. You must have had a feeling while yeah. dealing with this whole thing that he might have had his heart might have been flip it. He might have. Yeah, he he was crying. He was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe I've done this." I think he really realized how bad of a thing that he did. You know, like, I don't think he really knew the, what these kids were doing with these guns. I mean, he knew. He probably knew, right? obviously, but it really hit him hard when I explained to him, this this firearm was recovered at this homicide. This gun was recovered at this little kid got shot. Oh these are the guns. Yeah. You're funneling to these guys. Mm. And I think he, that really hit him hard. And he was just like, you're crying like any 21-year-old kid would. Sure. I mean, you hey, our, our brains are truly different at 21 compared to, say, 30. You know? Yeah. So, you know, I gave him an opportunity. I said, listen, you can either work for us or you can go to federal prison. Which one? Right. And he thought about it for a little bit and he agreed to cooperate. So I, I walked him out to the front door. We had agreed upon doing a um, what we call a reverse the next day, a, re- a reverse operation. And with the ATF, what we do you know, on reverses is I would give him guns with no firing pin that he would in turn sell to the gang members. And we would be there watching this whole deal. And we would swarm in, arrest everybody, including him to make it look good. Sure. And then once the bad guys get caught off the jail, we would uncuff him and put him up back on the street again. Right. So that was the plan. The next morning I'm at my station. Uh, I'm with my whole team. We are doing a, uh, this big debrief or briefing, I should say. And, it's 11 o'clock and I'm looking at my watch and my boss is looking at me going, where's your guy? Where's your guy? Call him on his phone, went right to voicemail. Waited a few more minutes, called him on his phone again, right to voicemail again. So this kid shut his phone off. Now I'm really panicking. Yeah. And I'm getting a little upset with myself. I let myself down for giving this kid an, op- an opportunity. And finally, my boss just sent everybody home. The deal didn't, the uh, the reverse didn't happen. Matt never showed up. That night, I called him. He didn't answer. I got a return call back moments later with an unknown number, and it was him. And he told me to F myself, said he didn't want to cooperate. He changed his mind. He wasn't a rat, that these kids were, were going to kill him and they were going to kill me. Ooh. And, I told, and I told him, Matt, there's no more negotiation. Uh, negotiating. You're going to federal prison when I get you. You're right. I'm getting war- I'm getting warrants for you. You're done. And he hung up on me. So the next morning, obviously, I went to federal court, had all my reports all up to date, and obtained several federal arrest warrants for all the charges that he committed and he admitted to. So my partner and I had gone by his house several times thereafter. Morning, noon, night, overnight, if we were out, no sign of him. What would you think, Steve? He's gone. He probably, he's gone, right, to Florida. He's gone to right. California, wherever. Yeah. He, he knows he screwed up. He knows he screwed us over. He, I told him I was coming for him. Gone. So now, fast forward about a month later, I had gone back to my regular routine, investigating other cases. and right. What not? And I, I remember doing a detail that morning, and I was going to work a night shift with my partner, Brian. It was going to be a relatively easy night because it was election night in the city. It was November 2nd, okay, 2010. And I remember doing a detail for Verizon, a National Grid, sorry, that morning. Just for people listening, a detail in Massachusetts is like, you know, directing traffic, road work type of deal for extra money. Right. So I got, I got released from my extra duty detail assignment a little early. I went to my station. I worked out in the gym for a little while. I remember I showered, I changed, I had jeans on, a nylon hooded sweatshirt because it's the fall, pancake holster on my belt, badge around my neck on a lanyard. I had no, no um, bulletproof vest on. I had nothing. I had bare minimum on, nothing. Brian meets me at the station. We try to figure out what we're going to do. We're going to call it an early night, right? We were going to go to the projects and sign up another kid that we had 
who was giving us information on drugs and guns. Um, but sadly, that kid that was going to meet us had a change of plans as well. He called us and said, I can't meet you until later on, guys, like around 9. Can we bump our meeting up a little bit? So yeah. now we're left, like, we got to fill in a void. Like, what do we do between 4 and 9? Right. So Brian, my partner, says, let's take a ride by, by Chris's house. Let's see if he's around. And I'm like, okay, it's been a month. We haven't seen him. What the hell? Right. Why not? So we got, I jumped in his car, and we drove up to uh, Highland Ave, drove by City Hall, took a left on Benton Street, took a left on Gibbons. That's where he lived. It's a one-way street coming down. And as soon as we got halfway down the street, what do I see? His car in front of his mother's house. Nice. So I'm like, holy crap, he's home. So I call my sergeant, I call my, my lieutenant. I have them meet us up at the corner so we can come up with a plan to get this kid in custody, right? So we're behind Anthony's function hall, which is right across the street from his house. And we're coming up with a, a solid, safe plan. Because keep in mind, it's 6.15 in the, at, in the early evening. So there's a lot of motor vehicle traffic. Yep. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic. And the city's buzzing because it's it's voter night. Everybody's voting for right. the local politics. Get local out of work, politics. they go vote. Right. And there's a lot of cops at these polling assignments, you know, working extra overtime duty, yep. you know, protecting the people and the, the voter integrity. So Brian and I are there with Joe McCain, Lieutenant Joe McCain and Sergeant Reardon. And we're coming up with this plan, and I, I wish I could show you because I have a PowerPoint, but it's kind of hard for you to – hopefully you can view, see it and imagine it in your head. So the suspect's car is in front of his house. It's a red two-door Honda Accord. We're across the street in a little parking lot that has some overgrown shrubs kind of blocking our view. Yep. His view to us, I should say. And we come up with the idea of I'm going to wait in the parking lot across the street, and when he comes out of his car – well, out of his house, I should say, and he gets into his car or trying to get in, I'm going to come up from behind and I'm going to just get him to the ground, prod him out, cuff him up. A little, like, jump jump him from the back, if right. you will. Brian's going to come up the one-way street, the one the wrong way, with his unmarked car with no headlights, and he's going to do what we call bumper locking. He's going to put his bumper on, his, on the suspect's bumper and not allow him to put it in drive and take off. And then I have my lieutenant and my sergeant are going to come running up the street, and they're going to be my backup in the event that I'm struggling with them hands-on. All right? So we agree upon this plan. As I'm walking back towards the opening where I'm going to be positioned, I see the porch light come on in this house, and his front door open, and I saw him standing there with a black puffy, looked like one of those, those um, brown face jacket, jacket or something. Yeah, like a North Face, like a puffy yeah. jacket. And he had a backpack slung over his shoulder. And he was waving to somebody in his house. I don't know who it was. I later found out it was his mom. So he waved to his mother goodbye. And he came walking out of his house, or his, his enclosed porch, if you will. Made it down a couple of stairs and made it to his car before I could get to him. Damn. Now, keep in mind, Steve, I had to have the element of surprise. I had to time this right. Because if he saw me, the chase was on. Right. And he's a kid. They're fast as hell. They're fast as hell. And <laughs> I know this, I know the streets, like the back of my hand, but where he has the advantage is he knows all these backyards. They're his neighbors. Right. I don't. I don't know who's got trampolines, broken fences. Pit bulls. Dog shit. Pit bulls, dog shit, kids' toys, raised sidewalks, fire hydrants, what have you. I've seen more cops in my career lose, lose their careers. Oh, yeah. With knee and leg injuries and shit like that. so Stepping off the McAdam. Exactly. So I, I'm not, you know, I don't want a foot chase. I want, to, I want to be surprising him. Right. So he makes it into his car before I could get to him. Now I'm running across the street. I got my badge outside my shirt. I got my gun in my hand. I open the car door. I grab the kid by the neck or his collar, and I'm giving him commands to get out of the car. Get out of the car, get out of the car, you're under arrest. He knows who I am. I just met with him less than a month ago. Right. You know? And you told him this was going to happen. And I told him I told him this was going to happen. So I got him, and I got my gun to his face, 
And right at that time, Brian came up and hit him bumper to bumper. So now we're struggling, we're fighting, he and I. He's yelling at me at the top of his lungs, F and shoot me, F and shoot me, F and shoot me. I don't see a gun. It's dark out. Right. I don't I don't see a gun at this point anyway. I got him by the neck, adrenaline. I got my gun on the side of his head. And I remember seeing the slide on my gun halfway back. Ooh, yeah. And I looked at it and I froze for a minute. And I'm like, shit. Out of battery. If my gun goes up, goes off here and I shoot this kid and he's unarmed, I'm the one that's going to federal prison, not him. Right. So I remember easing up and I took my gun away from his head, still holding on to him with my left hand. And right at that moment, my sergeant, Jerry Reardon, was running up the sidewalk with his gun in the air, screaming my name, Mario, Mario, Mario. And I looked over the roof of the car to see what he wanted. And when I looked back down, all I saw was flashes. Ooh. Pop, 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 Just Damn. Rapid, rapid fire shots. So that what I found out later was he had the gun tucked in between the seat and the shifter. And when he saw me look away for that split second, he reached down with his right arm that I didn't, I didn't contain at that point, and he just shot me at point blank range. Wow. What, was it was a handgun, point. obviously, a Glock or something? Or? It was a 9 millimeter. 15 round mag. So he had an extended magazine clip in it. Jeez. I can't believe this kid and you probably couldn't either would go from crying in a, in during an interrogation to wanting to work for you to shooting you, to trying to kill you. Yeah. That's quite the, quite the flip. He, he outright tried to murder me. Cold blood. Damn. Why were the, why were you, why was the Lieutenant and Sergeant yelling at you? Because you had the gun out and you were struggling with them? You know what? I, I've asked my sergeant several times. It's been 10 years now. He said that he he remembers the kid reaching for something and he was just trying to alert me that he was reaching. Oh, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe you didn't have the vantage point because you're, you're standing at the side. He couldn't see. Yeah. I'm looking down. You know, I'm in the door jam. He was running up the sidewalk so he could see through the wind, the front windshield. Maybe he saw him dip his right shoulder and, you know, reach. I don't know. Right. Um, so now I fall out of the car. I've been shot six times. I don't know it yet. Uh, I know I've been shot in my chest and stomach. And initially, is it like, let me ask you, is it, is it just hot or does it, I mean, there's pain or is, are you in shock now at this point? You're just adrenaline. It's just, all numb, numb in the adrenaline. So what I what I remember feeling was I had the chills and I felt like someone was putting out lit cigarettes out of my body. Ooh, geez. That's an interesting uh, picture to paint. Yeah. So I remember sitting there holding myself up and I I could I knew what was happening. I knew I could process everything perfectly. The problem was I couldn't respond fast enough. I knew I got shot. My brain was telling me, get up and get cover. Shoot this kid back. When I tried to get up to move, I couldn't move. I felt paralyzed. Like I felt like an elephant was sitting on me. Like a nightmare. I couldn't move. Yeah. So now I remember someone grabbing me by my shirt, by my uh, the collar of my T-shirt and my the pullover I had on and lift me off the ground, off my ass. And I remember looking up, and it was Brian Higgins, my partner. Brian had initially gone to the back of the car to shoot through the back windshield. He left his post, saw that I was in a bad situation, came around, put himself on the line of fire. He dragged me across the street diagonally behind us and left me under a parked car. So now I'm lying on the ground across the street. I'm hyperventilating because I could feel blood oozing out of me, yeah. just gushing at me. And I'm trying to catch my breath. And I could see the kid in the car. He's playing chicken. He's popping his head up over the steering wheel. And my guys are just keep shooting at him. There was over 62 rounds shot. Like whack-a-mole. Yeah. He's po- popping his head up over the steering wheel, dodging bullets, and they're shooting at him. And, and I said to myself, I got you. So I'm on my side, and my brain was telling my, 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 my arm, raise your arm up and shoot him. The only problem was, 
when I thought of doing that, I couldn't do anything. My arm wasn't moving. Instead, I heard rattling. And when I looked at my arm, I had a huge hole in my right forearm. So I took a round that went through my right forearm, through my ulna nerve, and out the back of my elbow. I couldn't pull my trigger finger. Wow. So you're having like ghost, uh, you're feeling like you can do it, but you don't have the physiological ability. Right. My brain was working fine. I was telling, my brain was telling my arm, pull the trigger and shoot him, pull the, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. But my arm wasn't moving. Wow. And I'll tell you right now, Steve, it was probably the most difficult moment during that whole horrific time because I felt so helpless. Yeah. I couldn't defend myself. I couldn't defend my guys. Right. All I could do was just lay there and just die. It's intense. And, and, and I tried. I tried so hard to pull, to move my trigger finger and pull it, but I couldn't. It wasn't moving. It was almost like my arm just went to sleep and my brain wasn't communicating with my with my arm. Wow. And again, I'm hyperventilating, all these different emotions. I'm hyperventilating. I'm trying to catch my breath. And I remember looking, just feeling so like just mentally exhausted. I laid my head back and I looked up at the sky and it was a, a clear sky that night and I could see stars up there. And I just said to myself, I'm about to find out what happens when you die. Wow. I'm never going to see my family again. Yeah. I'm about to freaking die. And I could hear the commotion, the yelling and the screaming and the, and the gunshots. And then my mind did something spectacular. My mind shifted from all that chaos to peace. I remembered going fishing when I was a young kid with my dad. I remember playing street hockey in East Somerville with all my friends. All these nice moments of my life when I was happy. It was it was almost like my mind was preparing myself for peace. Yeah. You know? And then it all reverted back to reality again within seconds. Yeah. And I could hear I could hear the gunshots, my guys yelling. I could hear the kids' mother screaming at the at our front door. That's my son, my son, they're shooting my son, and my guys telling her to get back in the house. And then finally, the the gunshot stopped. They ended the threat. They killed him in his car. Good. Yeah. And then my guys came to me, and they um, they put me on my back, and they would slap me in my face. The first one to me was Lieutenant Joe McCain, and uh, he's a big guy. He looks like a biker, sleeve tattoos and whatnot, and um. He, I remember him lifting me up and I reached up with my good arm and I grabbed his shirt and I brought him close to me and I told him, don't let me die, Joe. My, my son was only three years old at the time. I'm like, I got to get home to my boy. Yeah. I got to get home to my son. Don't let me fucking die. Don't let me die. And he said, you're not going to die, buddy. You're not going to die. Stay with us. Stay with us. And he was smacking me and like, not smacking me, but like tapping me in the yeah, face. Stay awake. Stay awake, you know, because he told me afterwards I was ash gray and my eyes were rolling in the back of my head. Yeah. But I, would, but I wouldn't shut up. So I knew if I kept talking, I was alive. If I can hear myself talking, I was alive. Right. So I kept telling him to keep me alive, you know, to not let me die. I needed to get home to my son. And then... They lay me down, and the other guys were putting, treating my wounds, putting pressure on them, identifying what was exit wounds and what was entry wounds. And they were debating. I was telling them to put me in the back seat or the trunk of their car and drive me to the hospital. I'm like, don't wait for an ambulance. I've lost too much blood. Get me the hell out of here. i got to get to a hospital. Yeah. And um, we could hear the sirens coming from the distance away, so I knew the cavalry was coming. They were close. Mm-hmm. When the paramedics finally got to me, they put me on the gurney. And as they were wheeling me to the back of the ambulance, I remember looking over and I saw my lieutenant, Joe McCain, sitting on the sidewalk with his his head in between his legs, sobbing. His gun was on the floor in between his feet. 
And what I, what I, what I later learned was when he walked away from me, he called his wife and told her that she was going to hear about an officer being shot on the news and that it wasn't him. He was okay, but it was me. Wow. He, he told her he lied to me and that he heard my last words. Oh my goodness. He wow. told his wife, he kept saying he needed to go home to his son. And I lied to him and told him he was going to be okay. That kid's going to die. He's, he's going to die. I just saw his, I just heard his last words. And this poor guy saw it all. Yeah. And he was sobbing. He was sobbing like a baby. I bet. You know, so that's what these types of events, the effects they have on our officers, you know. Only People imagine. don't know how tough it is on us. We're, we're human. Yeah. We're all human. So now I am getting closer to the back of the ambulance. And another more weird thing happened. I heard my deputy chief, Paul Upton, ask one of the paramedics, how's my guy look? And I heard the paramedic say, I don't think he's going to make the trip. Oh. Imagine you hearing that, Steve. No. That's <laughs> awful. Pretty much that's someone saying he's a dead man. Yeah. You know, people people ask me when I travel the country and I tell the story, you know, did that upset me? No. That actually, in retrospect, that actually helped me. I was so pissed. I was so livid that I heard that. That gave me the will to live. And I remember holding on to, with my good hand that little uh, metal bar on the on the gurney. And I had, like, crazy strength. I w- in my mind, I could have ripped that thing right off and hit somebody off the head with it. I was so pissed. So now I'm fighting with the paramedic that's inside the back of the ambulance with me, trying to get an IV in my arm. I'm yelling at him, telling him, you do your effing job, and I'm going to do my end. You keep me alive, and I'll fight to stay alive. I got to get home to my boy. Right. I need, to, I need to get home to my son. Do your effing job. And the guy said, oh, you have two sons? I said, what are you, an asshole? I just told you I had one. I didn't know that he was checking on my mental status. I thought it was being a punk, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. So he's telling me I have two boys. I only have one son, Andrew. He's three years old. Mm-hmm. So now I, um, they rush me to the hospital. I make it there. I remember when they backed into the bay, well, like into the area at Mass General, it's like a horseshoe. When they flung the doors open, all I remember seeing was a, a tunnel of blue. Cops on each side and when they took my bed out I remember them all tapping my leg hang in there brother we love you hang in there and I could see it was all oh, echoing man. I could see them yeah. and they rushed me into the building so now I'm in the upper uh, emergency room and I remember being prone out on a, on a bed and it was chaos it was pandemonium in there. The nurses and the doctors were all like, they were they were nervous. I could tell by the tone of their voices. And I'm lying there flat, just looking up at them. And, and the looks on their faces, they were horrified. Oh, my God. And I, I can't, can't imagine that. So I'm looking at them. I'm listening to them. You no, know, when they're looking thinking, at your body and they're, that, they're getting <laughs> right, that kind of right. reaction. So I'm thinking, like, how, how bad am I? Because I don't right. know how bad I look. I can't see. Yeah. I didn't want to see, you know. And I'm like, what the hell? They put a neck brace on me like they, they do everybody. Right. So I can't like bend down. All I know is people are working on me feverishly, and these people look horrified. So I blink my eye for a second. I remember just closing my eyes for a second, thinking, I can't believe I'm still alive. And then when I opened my eyes up again, they were all gone. The people that were once above me working on me were all gone. But I could still hear their voices nearby like they were behind me or something. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking at first, like, did they just abandon me? Like, what the hell happened? Did they just give up and say I'm a lost cause? Right. And as I'm trying to look around the room to find these people, like where, where are these voices coming from? Out of the corner of my eye, I remember looking and I saw a silhouette of a person. It was a woman. And I dipped my head to look and I saw this older nurse. She was dressed in white scrubs she had big, round, circular brown glasses, hair pulled back in a tight, tight bun. And this nurse walked over to my bed, 
right in my face. And with one hand, she lifted the back of my head up. And the other hand, she was massaging my forehead. And she kept saying to me, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And I, I looked at her and I said, please put a blanket on me. I'm very cold. And although I didn't see her leave my side, nor did I see a blanket, I felt warm instantly. Hmm. So I felt a sense of warmth. And then they rushed me out of that room without any warning. They were running down the hall. I could hear the doctor screaming, hold the elevator. We're going to floor three, OR 26, hold the elevator. I remember looking up and I could see Dr. King grabbing like the, the metal part of the front of the bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like a little handle type of thing, an arch. And he was dragging the bed. And we took a right to go to the elevator. Once we were in the elevator, I can hear him barking orders to the nurses. You fire up the x-ray machine. You get me X amount of units of blood. You do this. You do that. Now the door's open. I remember, ding, ding. Uh, elevator's door opens. They whisk me in the uh, OR, operating room. I know I'm there because it's much colder. Yeah, the it's operating much, rooms are always cold. It's much quieter. And the lights were much, much brighter. Mm. So I'm lying in this room now. It's not as, it wasn't chaos like it was down in the ER. Mm. They, they call it the trauma bay. So I'm lying there and I'm just staring at the, at the ceiling at these bright, bright lights that are on me. And, and I'm wondering, like, when are these people going to knock me out? Why am I still awake listening to all this shit? Right. And right at that moment again, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a silhouette of a person again. It was the same nurse. That was downstairs. The one of the white scrubs? The one of the white scrubs. So I leaned down to look at her and she came over to me and she came right on my face again, lifted the back of my head up with one hand, was massaging my forehead with the other. She kept saying to me, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. I assure you, you're going to be okay. And I, I looked at her and I just said, let me die. I'm tired of fighting. You know, tell my family I love them. Tell my son I fought hard to stay alive for him, but I just don't have it in me anymore. I, I'm tired. I'm too tired. Let me die. And she said, no, no, no. You're not going to die tonight. You're not going to die tonight. And then I went into darkness. I don't remember anything else after that. Wow. So uh, a day later, a uh, day and a half later, I woke up in the ICU. Um, down Praise God. Oof. Yeah. I woke up. I had a feeding tube up my nose and down on my belly. My wife was in the room, my parents. And uh, I didn't know where I was initially until the, well, some of the anesthesia wore off a little bit. And then I asked them, I'm like, where the hell am I? And they said, you're at the Mass General. And I remember looking down in my Johnny and I saw staples all over. I'm like, they got me like a fucking fish. Mm-hmm. These people cut me open like a fish. And my wife's like, you died three times. And they brought you back to life. Wow. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, that's that's what the doctor said. You died three times and they brought you back each time. So right at this moment, the nurses heard me speak to my family. They went and got Dr. King. He comes through the curtains into the IC area, ICU area. And he goes, hey, champ, how are you? And he grabbed, he grabbed my foot from the foot of the bed. And he squeezed it really hard. And he said, hey, can you feel that? I said, I can. I'm not paralyzed. He said, no. You were the luckiest SOB I've ever met in my life. <laughs> he said, you get, you get shot six times, died three times, and you, you're still here. And I thanked him. My parents thanked him. He told us that during the second event, I had a cardiac arrest. Obviously, I died. Right. He, had cut, he cut my diaphragm, and he reached in with his own hand and massage my heart back to life with his own hand. Wow. And he, t- he told me it's a military maneuver. That's when I learned that he was a colonel in the Army, and he's been deployed like 15 times back then. It's been more now. Yeah. Um, and this is a maneuver that these doctors learn in the military and, and that, that they perform out on the battlefield to our soldiers who are critically injured. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. To think, imagine- that, to think your hand was, was in a man's – or your heart was in a man's hand at one point. Yeah. Ooh, that gives me uh, heebie-jeebies. Yeah. So he pulled this maneuver with me, and it worked, and it saved me. So as I'm thanking him, my parents are thanking him for saving my life, I say to him, hey, Doc, there was a nurse here that night with me that comforted me. 
She kept me safe and she kept me calm. I want to meet her and I want to thank her personally. Can you go get her for me? And he looked at me and he said, what nurse are you talking about? And where did you see her? I said, well, I saw her in the, the trauma bay when I was first brought into the hospital. And then I, she was with me again in the operating room when you were there. And I, and I told him, you, you were pulling the bed in the hallway and you were screaming, hold the elevator, floor three, OR 26. I repeated verbatim things that he said. But I told him, you were barking at the nurses, telling them to do this, this, and this. And he looked at my parents. He looked really confused. He did a little timeout sign with his hand. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, I was on the, on the gurney, on the bed. He goes, no, you were dead. You were clinically gone for over three minutes. Wow. We, were giving you, we were giving you chest compressions and breaths. Dead people can't form memories. I don't know how you know all this stuff because you were, you were clinically dead. How do you know all this? I said, no, I was awake. I was talking to that nurse. We were communicating and I was watching you. He said, no, my friend, you were dead. You were clinically gone. You were dead. And I kept telling him, I need to talk to this nurse. I need to meet her. Yeah. And he said, my friend, there was nobody on my trauma team that looked like that. I, I don't know what to tell you. There was nobody on my team that looked like that. And uh, he, he, he appeased me and said, I'll do a triple check and I will check, but I'm, I'm certain there was nobody there. I know my trauma team. Sure. We were assigned to you. You know, there's no strangers. It's my team. Right. So when I described this older nurse to him the second time, my mom was in the room, obviously, with my dad. She had collapsed crying. But I didn't know why at, the, at that point. I just thought it was all the, just the dramatics of everything, you know. She kind of just had a moment. My right. dad helped, helped her up, put her on the seat. So I, I did a couple more weeks in the hospital, and I was eventually released. And um, when I went home, the day that I got home, I found out my wife was pregnant. And nine months later, on my birthday, my second son was born. So instead of God taking my life, he gave me a life. And that, paramedic, and that paramedic was right. I had two boys. I just didn't know it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. And then, yeah. And then the following day after I learned about my wife being pregnant, my mom and dad came over to my house with a uh, with some Portuguese kale soup because I was on a, a liquid diet. Mm, kale soup and is good. My, yeah, and my mom had a, a picture frame clutched to her chest. And she came in, and I was laying on the couch watching TV. She gave me a kiss on the forehead, and she said, I, I brought something to uh, for you because I want you to keep it on your wall. Promise me you'll keep it on your wall. And I said, of course. What is it, Mom? And she hands me the picture frame. When I flipped it over, I just bawled. I started crying, and I actually peed myself. And I said, this is my nurse. This is she. She's my nurse. This is it. It was my grandmother. The nurse was my grandmother. And what happened was I found out right at that moment, my brother John, who's also a cop in the same department, I mentioned that earlier, He, everybody heard that I died in the back of the ambulance, which was not true. I was still alive. My brother John called my parents to let them know that I had been shot and it didn't look good and to get dressed because they were going to send cruisers up to my mom's house to pick her up to bring her to the, um, the hospital. My mom, upon hearing this news, fell to her knees, dropped the cordless phone, and started praying to her mother to save me. And that's who came to my side at that very moment. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Holy cow. And she was she a nurse or she just looked like one? No, she was just dressed as one, but she wasn't a nurse in real life that okay. I remember. Yeah, I hadn't seen her in geez, forty years. She died in I think the mid eighties. She died young. She would have recognized young. her. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I hadn't she lived in Portugal. I came here when I was three years old in nineteen seventy two. She came to visit when we were little. You know, but I hadn't seen her in 25 plus years. And frankly, to be honest with you, that's the last person I, in the world I would ever thought would be next to me at the, at the hospital the night I got shot. <laughs> right. 
right? A grandmother who you haven't seen, who's been dead for 30 years. Right. I wasn't putting it together. I just, she just looked like this old lady nurse that was there comforting me. That's incredible. What did, what did your, um, when you shared this with your, your family, what did they think? What did they have to say? They were just in disbelief. My mom to this day says, uh, you know, she's, she's very religious and says, you know, I prayed so hard for her to save you. And then she also told me that I was her favorite grandson. You know, she told me a story that when we came here in 1972, that my grandmother was holding me at the airport in Portugal and was pleading with my mother to leave me behind with her. <laughs> that once my parents got situated here in America, she would come here and bring me to them. It was almost like she had a premonition that something bad was going to happen to me and she wanted to keep me safe. Wow. She was very protective, she was very protective of me. Yeah. It's an incredible story, brother. Thank you. Holy cow. I mean, when you and when you ultimately recover from something like this, um, I know you, what kind of support groups are there for that, for, the, for this kind of trauma, like this kind of insane, intense trauma? Well, luckily for us here in Mass, we have many um, stress debriefing groups. Um, there's, there's a lot of organizations out there that, that'll help. Um, the one that I founded in particular, Vipo, um, that's one of the things that we do. But there are other groups and other organizations that help and, and uh, peer support groups uh, throughout Massachusetts and different regions. And those folks do wonderful work. They, they get deployed and they go out, they stop what they're doing and they go out and they help their brothers and sisters in blue. Yeah. And that's how we need. Yeah. That's, uh, we had, um, when I worked on Cape Cod, we had an officer, um, shoot himself and Barn, you know, Barnstable PD, it's like the biggest PD yes. on, on yeah. the Cape. It's like, um, it's not huge, but I think it's 150 officers or something. So they have most of the resources that none of the rest of us had, but they had a critical incident team with police officers, psychologists, the whole deal. And they came down to our department and it was like, you know, it was really nice to, that this kind of thing for the older guys in the department to see this happen was like brand new. Like they'd never seen anybody, you know, care about a cop like this. Usually it was like, you know, there's an 800 number on the poster on the wall. If you have some feelings, you can call that. And you know, they won't tell anybody that was like, that's what they tell you, you know, but these new teams yeah. are, are incredible. So you're, you're specifically is for, um, very specifics for violently injured police officers. Is, right. Is it, um, is it a similar kind of response thing or is it, um, is it later on do you kind of introduce yourself to officers who are in these situations? Well, I, I partake in some of the, the uh, debriefings and peer support, the initial support. And then really where my organization comes into play is when an officer is ready to retire, if that's what they plan on doing, you know, I learned a lot about special legislation. You know, there is opportunities out there that an officer can get his or her full pay if done the right way and retire with 100% of their pay. Because the law says that if you're injured, the law is written as such, we well, only get 72% in the state. Right. And then and then you're capped at your earnings. You can only make $15,000. Yes, yeah, so you can't even get a side gig, right? No, you can't. So let me, let me enlighten you on some other stuff. Probably good for your listeners. So had I died that night, right? Had I died that night and not survived, my wife would have gotten a one-time federal payment of 389825 That's what it is today, present mm -hmm. day. That's the federal line of duty death payout. In addition to that, my wife would have got a $300,000 line of duty death payout from the state of Mass, tax-free, so we're looking at almost seven hundred grand right there. Right. Whatever my my base salary was or my rank, I was a senior detective. My wife would have received my full pay, a hundred percent of it, for the rest of her life, tax free. Every raise the Salvo Police gets, my wife would get. I lived at that time in um, in Billerica. Mm -hmm. I owned a home. My wife wouldn't have to pay taxes property taxes on our home to the town of Billerica. So you got real estate tax exemption. 
my children, who are three and a newborn, when they got older, if they want to go to college, they'd have in-state college tuition paid for for free. Right. And then when they got older and they wanted to be cops or firemen, if they took the civil service exam, they'd go right to the top of the list under a wounded veteran. It's called the 402A status. And then the last one is if you're a member of the NRA, they have a $35,000 line of duty debt payout for members. So these are all the benefits that you get when you die from right. line of duty. Heavy, now, heavy benefits. You know, decent. Although, let's, let's be honest. There's no price that you can put on a life of a human being, right. on a loved one. Obviously, yeah, but at least they're you're getting- no money can ever. Yeah, no money can ever replace a loved one that's lost. But right. However, at least they're giving the family a little bit of a financial bump and assist them in paying off a mortgage, any any outstanding bills. Take that worry but, away, at least. Exactly. But in the same token, if an officer survives an ordeal like that, like I did. The state says that a little bit more than half your pay is okay and cap you at $15,000 $15, a year. So you can't get, like you said, a side gig. Criminal. How, how are you supposed to survive and take care of your family when you're only getting a little bit more than half your pay and then you're capped at what you can earn? That's insane. I took a major hit financially. So because I, I knew about this special legislation and I did some digging – I went to my mayor through my chief and asked him to, to write this special legislation for me so I can get the 100%. And my mayor waited for two and a half years Ooh. to make a decision. During that two and a half year period, I sat at home worrying, not knowing what my future held for me, lost my career, got pulled, the rug got pulled off from underneath me. I was thinking... How do I take my kids on vacation, my wife and children? How am I going to pay for their for their college? Right. How do I pay for my bills? Like, how do I get ahead? I can't, you know? And finally, with the help of a senator, the late Senator Ken Donnelly, God rest his soul, he got my bill passed through the state house, and I ended up getting 100%. And then one day, because of all the struggles that I endured during that two-year period, I had an epiphany. I was praying, and I, I had the idea of why don't I create a nonprofit and help make better change, make effective change for the good. And what we did was my partner and I, Bob DiNapoli, we wrote up legislation that now when it's passed, any cop in this state of Mass who gets shot, stabbed, run over by a, a vehicle, assaulted with a deadly weapon, they'll get 100% of their pay for life, tax-free with all their raises. Their medical is going to be covered by their department. And there's no income restrictions on their earnings. Thank goodness. As long as, you, as long as you work in the private sector, you can make as much money as you want and collect your full pension from your department. And guess what, Steve? You've earned that shit. Yeah. You've earned it. Amen to that, man. I've been through, You've earned it, and you more than deserve that break, yeah. that ability to take care of your family. So I'm not Absolutely. trying to compare the dead to those that survive, but in the same token, we, we can't be forgetting those that survive and get critically injured. We need to honor them and take care of them and give them an opportunity to be human again, to give them an opportunity to take care of their families again. We owe that to them. You know, These lawmakers owe that to us. They call on us to protect their sorry asses. They need to be doing something to protect us. Absolutely. We're there Absolutely. to protect them. Who's there to protect us? Yeah. As of now, nobody. Everybody's turned their back, sadly, on us. You know, in recent years because of the political climate out there. But you know, I'm hoping it turns around. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. With the, I mean, of course it is right and good for a fallen officer's family to be taken care of financially. But it's almost, if you know the powers, the the big players and the powers that be, you know, it's almost like they're, it's like they're guilted into it. It's like, well, the, the guy died and his family's going to suffer. It's not, they're not doing it because they care about the cop. They're doing it because it's like, it's so over the top, the right thing to do. They're going to, they're going to do it. Cause otherwise they're going to lose major face. But if the guy lives 
now they have a little bit of you know leeway here to to screw you to not come through with these big payments the, the cop lived he got his life so well his life's ruined and now he's suffering and somehow we're going to give him like so much less like it, it just makes sense what you're doing i mean it's thank god you did that especially for me i'm still working anything could happen to me you know to think that i could be crippled or unable to work and then have a cap like well yeah but it, if you make too much we're going to take that away from you holy cow it's, it's insane yeah. Jeez. And it's, it's, it's an issue that a lot of cops and people don't think about until it happens to you is when you really realize, holy shit, I'm in trouble here financially. I'm going to be in trouble. You know, we, it's the elephant in the room. No one wants to talk about it or think about it because we hope it never happens to us. But right. look at what's going on around us. Cops are being ambushed and assaulted every day out there, it seems. we got to have protections in place. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we were of us are lucky enough to survive. Absolutely. And we, we rely way too much on overtime and details too. It's like, I know so many, I try not to get into it, but it's, it's hard. Like I know so many buddies that like the lifestyle they live and the, them, their family and, and they lived to, is dependent on this overtime and detail. So never mind, Like if you lost all your overtime and details, if you get injured and can't do anything, Dude, that ship's going down. I mean, it's just it's just not going to work. Um, let me let me bring up um, Vipo here. And this, with your organization that you formed here, do you help police officers kind of navigate these waters and get what's coming to them? Yeah. So if some like right now, I'm helping an officer in Lawrence, an officer in Lowell, and two officers in Springfield, all of whom, well, three of them were shot. Um, and one guy was dragged by a car. Um, So I help them go through the special legislation process until such time my bill passes and becomes a law here. Because then all these officers have to do is just provide documentation that they're permanently injured, doctor's letters and whatnot, and they'll automatically get this benefit. But for now, it's going to be done individually through each individual municipality, through the chief and the mayor's office or the town manager, and then it goes up to the state house. So I help these officers navigate through this process because I've become pretty much like an expert on it. I've done it so many times um, over the last 10 years, and uh, I haven't lost the case yet. That's awesome. I'm 14, yeah, I'm 14 for 14. God bless you. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's what a shame you have to hold people's feet to the fire to make them do it. I, I'm sure towns yeah. and cities are like, whoa, whoa. You know. Some have been good, to be fair to them. Some of these mayors have been really, really good and cooperative. That's good to a lot hear. Of the chiefs, yeah, a lot of the chiefs have been great to work with. I love working with the mass chiefs. They're fully behind me. Yeah. And they're, they're very supportive, so I'm thankful to them. Um, and again, some mayors in some of these towns, they've been a blessing to work with. Some not so much, but that's not all of them. Okay, that's to good fair, to hear. To be fair. Yeah, to be fair, it's not all. Mario, I've, I've had you. I've kept you here over an hour. Um let me ask you. Let me ask you about Gunrunner. We haven't even talked about the book yet. Is this is this based on these events or is this uh, fiction? Yeah, no, it's a, it's all true crime. Uh, the book starts when I was a young kid in Portugal, immigrated here to America legally, of course. Um, right. Aspired aspire to be a cop as a young boy. Um, the, the readers will read about my life as a young kid, getting into the academy. There's some funny stories about the academy. Oh, great! And then. It, it just takes you through my career in patrol into detectives, some of the major cases that I worked, and then that eventually leads to my murder, to this case that, that the, your listeners just heard. And wow. um, the message is, you know, it hopefully when these readers, these people read this book, they'll have hope. They'll find peace within their life, hope that their lives will be better because everybody has struggles and have, has issues, you know? Of course. And faith. Hopefully, it'll re, it'll their faith in whatever God that they believe in will be restored after reading my book. And I'll let your readers go onto Amazon and read the reviews. It was a number one bestseller. People said, you know, say that they can't. Once they start reading, they can't stop reading. It's a roller coaster ride of emotions, up and down. They'll be laughing, they'll be crying, and like I said, at the end, they'll hopefully feel those three emotions: hope, faith, and peace. And Great. that's the common message that I've received. 
So I think I've done people justice in crafting a story with my partner, Keith Notek, who's phenomenal. And I don't want to um, not mention him. If it were not for him, this book would not be possible. He's a great man. Excellent. Where can we get it? Amazon? Um, everywhere? It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Target.com, Walmart.com. But I think Amazon is the way to do it. We have a Kindle version. We will, in a short time, have an audiobooks option as well. But it is available on Kindle and paperback. All right, awesome. I'll link it in the show notes and on the website. Mario, one last question if you have a sec, because this is a popular one with uh, a bunch of the listeners, is advice to new officers getting into the job now? Wear your vest. You know, um, build off the foundation that you formed at the academy. You know, they gave you the basics. You know, continue to go to training. Take every training opportunity serious through your department. Focus pay attention, learn as much as you can, but more, most importantly, be a good human being out there. Treat people right, give people an opportunity, and hopefully God will be by your side right. and give them a long and healthy, prosperous um, career in their, on their job. Mario Oliveira, thank you, sir. It was an honor to have you on the show. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to do the outro for the show now. Can I put you in the green room and get right back to you? In a couple minutes? Sure, absolutely. Right. Hey, guys, episode number 111, Mario Oliveira. Oh, my goodness, what a story. He had me going there with the uh, the police officers touching his leg when they were wheeling him in all lined up. Holy cow. Uh, incredible story. Gun Runners, the book. Um, violently Injured Police Officers Organization, uh, vipo911.org, vipo911.org is the website. Um, all the links, um, for Mario will be in the show notes guys. Thank you for joining us again. Um, if it wasn't for you guys, um, tuning in, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't be getting our, our message out for all these things, all these crazy things, uh, the men and women of law enforcement experience. Um, if you have time, if you love the show, Apple podcast, five-star review, please. And thank you. Just do it. And also, um, if you really love the show and you want to show your support, Patreon is a place to do it. There's a link in the show notes for Patreon. Also, thingspolicey.com. Scroll down, click donate. There you have it. Two tiers, patrolman or sergeant. And if you want to be a guest or know somebody who you think would be a good guest, scroll down on thingspolicey.com and click on be a guest and submit your info or their info. And let me know. We can get you on here. So, guys, good to uh, <laughs> say good to see you. <laughs> Glad you were here, and I'll catch you next time.